Hello and welcome to this program on data-driven approaches to crime and traffic. This program is presented by Idaho Peace Officers Standards and Training in cooperation with the International Association of Directors of Law Enforcement Standards and Training, or IATLIST. During this presentation, you will hear from several individuals with prominent roles in the DDAX project. Idaho Post has taken on this project as a statewide effort to reduce crime throughout Idaho. You will hear from agencies who have experience in reducing crime up to 30% in their DDAX efforts. We hope this presentation will be useful to you and encourage you to adopt the DDAX program within your community. My name is Mike Bacar. I'm the executive director of IATALYST. IATALYST stands for the International Association of Directors of Law Enforcement Standards and Training. In other words, all the posts in the United States make up our association. And um, one of the things we've done for the past three years is a federal grant from NHTSA to train officers nationwide on DDAX, Data Driven Approaches to Crime and Traffic Safety. And what's exciting to me, after training about 470 agencies, is to see how effective this model has been. Um, there's been agencies now that have two and three years worth of data that have compared results of using the DDAX model, and they have seen all of their crime reduced. I'm talking about burglaries, rapes, robberies, uh, thefts, uh, you name it all down, anywhere from 15 to 60 percent. Uh, traffic crashes down, s the same numbers, and uh, officer contacts up. Uh, that's exciting. They're doing this without additional resources, no overtime, just using the people that they have, and w we're all stretched thin uh, with the economy today, and agencies aren't getting uh, additional manpower. Many of them are being cut but they're able to utilize this and deploy their people more effectively. With that said, I want to introduce you to Peggy Schaefer, who is our National Program Manager for IATALYST, and she's going to talk about the seven guiding principles which are at the heart of this program. So what are the seven guiding principles? Principle number one is, is working with your partners and stakeholders. Who are your partners and stakeholders? Those are those individuals in your community that have a vested interest in helping you reduce crashes in crime. Could be businesses, could be uh, district attorney's office, could be individuals with a housing authority. All of the individuals in your local community that care about reducing crime, those are your partners and your stakeholders. Principle number two is data collection. What do we say about data collection? It's trying to capture all of the information that's happening in your communities, whether it relates to traffic crashes, where your robberies are, where your burglaries are, where the officers respond to, where your traffic crashes are. All of that comes together with your analysts. What does your analyst do? That's principle number three. Your analyst works closely, compiling all of those data points to determine where exactly we need to deploy those officers so they are most effective. That leads us to principle number four, strategic operations. When officers know exactly where in their community they need to respond, they're more effective. So as an example, in Shawnee, Kansas, they were able to identify an entire road, their 75th corridor, and they deploy their officers there on a routine basis, and they were able to reduce their traffic crashes in crime. Principle number five is information sharing and outreach. So as we gather all this information, we start to reduce crime and crashes in our community. We want to share that information with our partners and our stakeholders and the officers and the citizens in our community. Principle number six, monitor, evaluate, and adjust. We use that principle precisely to look back at our data, see what's going on, see if we're making a difference in the communities and in those hot spots that we're trying to identify and work in, and then adjust our strategic operations and come back and hit those areas or even newer areas a little bit more purposefully. And then principle number seven is always to evaluate our outcomes and make sure that we're not just writing tickets we're really, in fact, making a difference by reducing traffic crashes and also reducing crime. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration funds our DDAX project because they know it works to reduce traffic crashes. Like so many other programs that uh, NHTSA sponsors, click it or ticket, booze it and lose it, NHTSA knows this model works because they have seen countless examples 
successful examples across the country. Now let's hear from one of our subject matter experts, Howard Hall, who's chief of police with the Roanoke County, Virginia Police Department, and previously a captain with the Baltimore County Police Department, one of the first agencies to use the DDAX model. My name is Howard Hall. I'm the chief of police in Roanoke County, Virginia. There's a couple of important points that I like to emphasize about data-driven approaches to crime and traffic safety. First is DDAX is an operational model. It is a way of doing business as opposed to a program that has a start and an end date. DDAX changes our philosophy from being reactive to proactive. DDAX is also a place-based strategy. Uh, this is important because there's research that has shown uh, that the majority of social harm, particularly crime, happens in a very small percentage of our geography. Uh, for instance, a study done in the city of Seattle found that 50% of crime was taking place in just about 5% of street segments. So imagine the impact that we could have by dealing with that 5% uh, and reducing those incidents uh, in that area. DDAX is also evidence-based, which means when we identify our target areas, when we identify those places where bad things are happening, we use proven strategies to try to reduce the problem. One of the primary strategies that we use in the DDAX model uh, which has been proven is high visibility enforcement, officers making traffic stops. That traffic stop may be the single most important or single most beneficial self-initiated activity that our officers uh, can take part in. And I say that for a couple reasons. Uh, one, a traffic stop gets us general deterrence, general deterrence for traffic crashes and for crime, simply because people that see a police officer engaged actively in traffic enforcement are likely to change their driving behavior uh, and it may deter them from committing a crime in that area. Uh, DDAX also provides specific deterrence. Traffic enforcement changes people's driving behavior, makes them drive better, obey the law, pay more attention. DDAX can also specifically deter crime because we know the results of traffic stops can be people who are wanted, people that have illegal weapons, people that have illegal drugs, or people that are responsible for crimes uh, in our community. Another important benefit of high visibility enforcement is the information that we collect. Every time we stop a car, uh, we find out about the person who's driving that car. We obviously get the vehicle information, the time, and the day. That can be very, very valuable intelligence information. Later on, if we discover that crimes have been occurring in those areas uh, and detectives are working to uh, follow those crimes up. DDAX encompasses all of these principles and allows us to use our resources more efficiently uh, and more effectively. So from a police chief's perspective, we all have limited resources. It's incredibly important that we use those limited resources in the places that they're needed the most, at the times they're needed the most, and doing the things that are likely to have the most impact on social harms that are occurring uh, in our communities. I have actually uh, worked on implementing DDAX in two different agencies. Um, my first experience was with the Baltimore County Maryland Police Department where I was a commander uh, and finished up my career uh, in the summer of 2012. Uh, we implemented DDAX sort of right at the beginning uh, of the development of the model uh, because we wanted to make sure that we were using our resources uh, to fight crime and to also reduce traffic crashes in our communities uh, that create you know, a great deal of property damage and personal injury and even uh, fatalities. And we thought that uh, by focusing on problem areas that overlapped and doing it in the longer term, uh, we could have more impact. Uh, and we saw substantial impact in reducing crimes like robbery and burglary, uh, as well as reducing our traffic crashes. Now, when I started in Roanoke County uh, last year, uh, we began to look at our crime analysis data. And just as in Baltimore County and just as in you know, at this point, literally dozens of agencies that I've had the chance to visit uh, within the DDAX initiative, we found that uh, in many places where we're having criminal incidents, we were also having traffic crashes. So it just made sense uh, to try to target those areas. So we've been working to implement uh, DDAX in Roanoke County. Uh, we have our plans in place and our officers are actively working those uh, target areas because we know uh, that using those resources in those areas are likely to have uh, the most beneficial effect on our public safety. 
I'm going to argue that you can start DDAX with whatever you have today. This is not about adding more resources. And in fact, uh, in Baltimore County, uh, where I worked with this model, and now in Roanoke County, uh, we have not added resources to do this. Uh, we have not used additional overtime uh, to do this. We've done it with existing resources. And, and rather you're a very, very large department or very, very small department, you start with the resources that you have. You start with the data and information capability that you have, uh, which in some cases might be, you know, fairly unsophisticated. And I've told agencies, if all you have is a map with some pins in it, that's where you start. And you build it from there. Uh, and we use existing resources by identifying non-committed time within our patrol force uh, that we can dedicate to our target areas. To some degree, we have to change our culture a little bit. Uh, historically, police departments have assigned officers based on posts or sectors or beats, uh, and they go to those areas and that's their area of responsibility, and they don't very often stray from that area. Uh, by using a data-driven target area, hotspot type of approach like DDAX, we're suggesting that our resources are best used when we concentrate them in the areas where they're needed the most. Uh, so we may move those officers around a little bit and have them going in and out of target areas that may or may not be within their assigned beater sector or post. Uh, and there's actually some research out there that suggests uh, you can really maximize your effectiveness by sending officers into target areas for about 15 minutes at a time uh, and then letting them go on to something else uh, and perhaps have another officer a short time later come in for another 15 minutes so it can be done without additional resources and without overwhelming existing resources. The vast majority of police and sheriff's officers in this country, uh, based on community policing models over the last 20 or 25 years, have developed good working relationships with their communities. Their residential communities, their business communities, other government agencies. Start there because you don't have to start from scratch. Uh, if you have existing community associations that you're already communicating with, uh, they're going to be primary stakeholders. Start laying the foundation for DDACs. Start involving them uh, from the prevention side uh, in target areas. Uh, look at your business community, chambers of commerce, uh, business associations, uh, any individual businesses that have uh, a stake that you may be able to partner with. Uh, they have captive audiences in terms of their employees where you can share information and provide crime prevention information they may have resources uh, that you can use. Uh, you know, think about the IT capabilities sometimes if that's something that you're uh, short on. Uh, look to other government agencies. From a traffic safety perspective, your traffic engineers are tremendously important. Uh, sometimes they can evaluate a traf traffic problem and by making even minor changes to roadway design uh, help you achieve significant reductions in traffic crashes. Uh, Look around your communities. You know, there's military communities that are using this model that involve the provost marshal and the military police and that military community uh, for ideas uh, and help. Look to your school systems. You know, there's another potential source of knowledge if you have a, particularly an institute of higher education that might have an IT department uh, or a criminal justice department that would have students that could help you perhaps with data and analysis uh, and evaluation. Uh, honestly, you know, the list can be as long as you want it to be uh, by just sort of sitting around and brainstorming a little bit. I think the bottom line as a police chief is that DDAX is a model that you can use uh, to make sure that your resources are being used in the places they're needed most, at the times that they're needed the most, and that those officers are doing the things uh, that you need them to do to be effective in making your community safe. My name is Jeff Levy. I'm the Chief of Police for the City of Meridian. We have a population of about 81,000 people. And Meridian Police have done um, tactical analysis for both our traffic and our, our crashes and our crime within our cities. And we always did those separately. And then in 2011, we adopted the DDAC strategy, which really is a dynamic evidence-based system that actually looks at an overlay of where your crash is and where your crime is occurring and trying to concentrate resources in those areas. Now the intersection of Fairview and Eagle in the city of Meridian is the busiest intersection in the state of Idaho. 
We have a major uh, retail on both the south and north sides of the roadway, and we were getting a considerable amount of calls for service in that area. So when we overlaid our maps, we actually were able to see a, a pattern of, of both crashes and traffic violations and crime. And so we started putting those together through the DDAX analysis and concentrating unobligated time in those areas. So we didn't have to um, bring in more officers on overtime. It's just when the officers didn't have things going on, we concentrated those resources in that part of the city. And some of the successes that we've had is, has just been unbelievable. Just this past eight months, we've seen uh, regular crashes drop about 5%. We've seen crime rates drop about 13%. And really what our, our main focus in the area was um, reducing serious injury crashes. And that's where we've had our, the most significant success. Our injury crashes have reduced 31%. We've also have noticed that 15 to 18% of our calls for service occurs in this small zone. Now, we've also during that time, just this past year, have realized that um, our calls for service have increased 25% in that area. And it's really caused us to look at, should we adopt another DDAC zone? We actually were gonna expand the one that we had and we realized we wanna keep it fairly small and we wanna be able to concentrate certain sectors. Also, the significance of that is we were basing our first DDAC zone on benchmarks that went back three or four years. And with this new zone just being a part of the city, we didn't have that same data. So we didn't really want to mess up with our, our data on our first zone as we concentrate on the second zone. So any agency that's looking at um, exploring the DDAC strategy, uh, I would highly encourage them. And like I said, it's a dynamic evidence-based problem-solving tool, but really it, our operational model is, is still with our community-based policing. So we really concentrate our resources in that area to better our community. What hurdles did we, we have to overcome as we were uh, looking at uh, adopting the DDAC strategy? And really, as other people have said, is you can be a small department, you can be a large department, it really doesn't matter. Where you really need to, to have is, is a good idea of, of your statistics. And you need to have either a crime analysis person that can pull that data out of your RMS systems or your CAD systems, or you need to have a record supervisor or someone that's familiar with that to, to get that data. Because one thing that we found is where we believe the problems are in the city is not necessarily where the problems occur. And we have to rely on the actual data to prove that. So you need to have somebody that can really um, pull that data and put it in some sort of map and understand that. But you don't have to be a large agency to do that. You just have to have someone with that knowledge. One of the other hurdles is uh, maybe buy-in. Uh, People don't realize uh, what you're trying to do. They think it's just this, this fly-by-night thing you're trying, or we'll just try this thing. And, and they really need to see results to really get that buy-in and that ownership. And that's what we've done, is we've kept an open communication with our officers to show this is exactly what you're doing, and this is the outcomes that you're achieving. And that has had great success for us as well. Um, the other hurdle that you may run into is the officers believe that their uh, unobligated time is their unobligated time and you need to convince them that they're still on the clock, they're still getting paid by the city, and you're going to direct them to where um, you want them to go. And you know with our mission in, in the city of Meridian it's, it's education, prevention, and enforcement. And if they're not doing enforcement type duties then we're going to be put them into the zones into these DDEC zones to have the greatest impact. Now calls for service will dictate uh, how long they work there, um, but when they don't have things going on, that's where we actually put them. You know, the, the smaller department you have, the easier it is to reach out to everybody, but I believe it's just open communications. You need to sit down and explain to them what you're trying to accomplish. And I think our biggest success is when we were actually able to show them the overlay maps where you could actually show this is where the crashes are occurring, this is where the crimes are occurring, overlay those maps together and say we are going to concentrate our resources in these areas to get our greatest impact with, with the resources that we, we put there. That's probably where we've had the most success. The one thing that you will go to uh, your city councils or your county commissioners and you'll explain to them DDACs and the first thing they're going to say is what the heck is that? And it's just another acronym. And so you need to overcome that. Uh, one of the things that we have done is we've, we told our city council, 
look, this is something that we have already been doing for a long time. What we're doing is now we're just mer merging those data points together and concentrating on this area. So for us, it wasn't anything new. Um, it was just a different approach to what we were already doing and, and having a greater um, impact. I think if you can show the results, the positive outcomes, and go back and periodically report those to your city councils or your, your, to, to your commissioners, that's where you're going to have the greatest success. We have complete 100% buy-in from our city council on defects. Some of the, the smaller um, departments, three, four, five men, um, that may not have all the computers and everything else, it's not necessarily needed because one of the things that we found is that in those smaller cities you probably have lower crime rates, you have lower crashes, and it's easier to keep track of those. So if you just look at your patrol logs and you start mapping out on um, you know, Google Earth for matter or Google Maps, you can sit there and just put a little red pencil, a little dot on the map and you can start putting, building your maps that way. You don't have a whole lot of data points to put on there, so you, you can do that without having to uh, to invest much into it. Well, there's been some agencies across the state that have actually been working in partnership with our TDAC zones. And I guess it would be like any other task force or some sort of group that we work. Um, if you're going to make it successful with DDACs, we welcome any resources there, but you actually have, to, the key thing is you actually have to keep track of the, of the data. So if you brought additional resources in, whether it was ISP, or whether it was a different uh, neighboring agency, you're gonna have to keep accurate stats so you can you can uh, benchmark your outcomes. So I think it would work just like it would like a DUI task force or anything else. This is a group that's working this zone tonight. These are the stats that they're gonna keep. And then you give those stats to your, to your person that's actually um, crunching all the numbers and then you'll be able to do that. Um, so far in Meridian, we haven't um, used a whole lot of additional resources other than what we've had. Um, but that's, that's an interesting thing to look at. I do know that ISP has is, is, is been a great partner in everything that we do. Uh, and with them being here in Meridian, we're probably already getting a significant response to them being in that corridor without us knowing it. So all of those, those stats that I've shared with you um, are probably, could be even greater if we were to, to account for everything that's, that's being done for other law enforcement agencies. One of the things that uh, we have done here in Meridian is uh, provided our data to NHTSA and to other agencies. Uh, not because we think that we're the experts, but we have gone through um, trials and errors. We, we know what's worked and what hasn't worked. Uh, we've helped the city of Nampa. We've helped the city of Caldwell. We've helped other small agencies. We actually sat down with uh, Nampa and Caldwell to explain to them what we have done and they soon realized that it wasn't as daunting as they thought. Uh, a lot of agencies are already doing it in some sort of factor, um, and this is just putting everything together and looking at new benchmarks and, and outcomes. Uh, Nampa and Caldwell have already shown uh, great successes in, in the areas that they're doing, and that's the, the one thing that I would like to, to get other agencies convinced of is that you're already doing it, you're probably just not keeping the data to show your benchmarks and your successes. So that's what I would suggest that you do. So when you go to ask for more people from your city councils or your county commissioners, you can show them the successes that you're having, the impact that you're having in the community, and then use that as data to get more resources if you need it. I know that with Caldwell, one of the key things that they originally realized is where they thought their problems were were not where their problems were in their city. So when they started looking at their data and where they were responding to, it was slightly different than the areas that the officers had thought. But that really goes back to community policing and everything else. What officers think are the problems in our communities are not necessarily the problems that affect our citizens. And so by looking at their data points on their computer, they were, really, they were able to kind of adjust the, the corridors that they set up. Hello, I'm Sheldon Kelly, Captain with the Idaho State Police. We at the Idaho State Police are fully supportive of the DDAC strategy. Using data to help reduce crime and crash rates in the state of Idaho is very exciting to us. When establishing your DDAX model, don't forget about the State Police. We are happy to assist in whatever way we can. We are spread throughout the state and already work with allied agencies in various capacities. I encourage you to contact your local district office and see what resources we have available to assist you.
the very simple, quick idea behind DDAX. A big advantage is the number one principle of DDAX, and that's our partners and stakeholders. You get the businesses involved, you get the Rotary Club and the Kiwanis and all those different uh, organizations involved, and you educate them uh, what is DDAX and why are we targeting a particular area and deploying resources because this is where the problem is, this is where the crime is, and the businesses get excited. <laughs>to learn about the um, DDAX implementation workshop. It is a two and a half day workshop. There is no cost to attend a DDAX workshop. It is completely funded on a NHTSA grant. Officers come for a two and a half day workshop learning the techniques and strategies with the hope that they will be able to develop a plan and then when they go back home to their respective agencies they're able to implement the plan. This project comes out of NHTSA headquarters in Washington DC. But NHTSA is also made up of 10 regions throughout the United States. In each region, there are state highway traffic safety offices and governor traffic safety representatives who have all been briefed on the DDAX model. And in many instances, they can help pay agencies training to attend some of these workshops. A great resource for Idaho would be Region 10, which is made up of Washington, Oregon, Montana, Idaho, and Alaska and their headquarters is in Seattle, Washington. The contact is Gina Beretta. Her email is gina.beretta at dot.gov. You know, another great resource that we have is NLEARN. NLEARN stands for the National Law Enforcement Academy Resource Network. On NLEARN, there's an entire section on DDAX, which can be very valuable. You can see upcoming training happening all over the nation. You can download additional resources such as media and outreach efforts. You can download success stories, general information, and statistics to back up your program, or just share resources and ask questions of other subject matter experts around the nation. So it can be very valuable if you can use that resource, and it's absolutely free of charge. There's no cost for any law enforcement officer or trainer to sign up for NLEARN. We have held three workshops in Idaho, and some of the agencies that have attended and are now using the DDAX model include the Idaho State Police, Jerome Police Department, the Nampa Police Department, Caldwell Police, Ada County Sheriff's Office, Meridian Police, and Boise Police. Our office can provide additional technical support for any agency that's struggling in the DDAX philosophy. We can send in a chief, to talk to area chiefs and sheriffs. We can send in supervisors. We can also do in-person or remote assistance for data analysts on how to collect data, how to analyze data, or how to map that data. All you have to do is contact iAtalyst and we'll do everything we can to give you this support. iAtalyst just recently got another project uh, from the Department of Justice to train crime analysts and agency heads, chiefs and sheriffs. And the, the training is basically twofold. We're going to train the analysts not only on how to get good data for DDAX and um, data-driven approaches to crime as well as uh, smart policing, all of those things, but also to train the agency heads, the chiefs and sheriffs, on what kind of things that the analysts can provide to them, and we're training the analysts to understand what's important to the agency heads and what they need to uh, make the right decisions in their community. Contact myself at iAtalyst. Our website, which is www.iatalyst.org, or they can contact Peggy Schaefer, who is our national program manager, and uh, she's putting together the workshops all over the country. In 2011, the Post Council adopted performance objectives for the Patrol Academy to give students a foundational concept of what the DDAX model is. This was done in order to enhance the statewide effort of creating DDAX as a model for crime enforcement in Idaho. By teaching basic Patrol Academy students the foundational concepts of DDAX, it's entirely possible that they'll come back to your agency wanting to implement them in their patrol duties. You as an administrator need to know what these concepts are about and what the DDAX program can do for your communities. 
Thank you for watching this program on DDAX. We hope the information that's been presented to you will help you in your efforts to fight crime and traffic enforcement in your communities and become a statewide partner in the effort for DDAX enforcement in the state of Idaho.